I would like to welcome our second panel. Dr. Tom Coburn is a United States Senator from the State of Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Coburn, we really appreciate you taking so much time out of your busy schedule as well to be able to appear before the subcommittee today. Uh, your entire written statement will obviously be, be made a part of the record. Uh, you have done extensive work in grant research, and uh, we are very grateful for your testimony today and we will be very honored to be able to receive that now. Well, thank you, and it is a pleasure to be before you. I was just observing uh, the, the members in here, not one of you were in the House with me, uh, which was not all that long ago. I left in 2000. So uh, it is a privilege and a pleasure to come before you. I, I want to say at the outset, your last panel, I have worked with Danny Werfel for seven years, and it is phenomenal. glad he is where he is now. Uh, but when you, you talk about IGs, they are key to us knowing what is going on. The Government Accountability Office is key. And I could not work in the Senate without the Congressional Research Service. They are excellent. So we, we have the tools to solve the problems in front of us. Uh, the problem is, is not enough people know what the problem is. Um, and I would, I would say if you are looking for a model agency on how they handle grants, is go look at the Museum and Library Sciences. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> There is not a grant that they put out that they don't follow up. There is not a grant that they don't check to see if they are meeting the requirements of the grant that was submitted. So they have 100 percent follow-up. And so consequently, the expectation has changed in terms of libraries and museums that if you get a grant for the Federal Government, you better perform. <clears throat> in other words, they have created the expectation. And I, we don't even hardly look at them anymore because they really do a great job. So they are a great model. And so if you wanted to follow up on this, is to bring them up and say, what are you all doing? Because I can guarantee it is not being done in the rest of the government the way they do it. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I would tell, uh, Mr. Werfel talked about USAspending.gov. Myself and President Obama were the authors of that. And, and they are basically in violation of that bill because they were supposed to have subgrants and subcontractors on that at this time, and they have chose not to put the resources in to get there. Uh, but if we had subgrantees and, and subcontractors on it, you could actually find. You can search that site by anything. It is like a Google site. You put in the name FISH, you will see every penny we spend on FISH. In other words, it is a good site. It just hadn't been fully uh, blended out. And the granularity in there is because we don't put the, the subcontracts and subgrants in there so that you can know. And, and it is important to know for, uh, through the grant process who is getting the money and for what. Uh, and it is not just to look at the money, but what is being done with it to see if it is really a purpose that we intend. Uh, as you noted, uh, <clears throat> my statement will be made part of the record and I will be very brief. We have done several reports on grants and agencies uh, through my office, and, and I could not do that without GAO and CRS we, the, they, and the IGs as well. Uh, they make it easy for us to put together the information. But the, the last one, and let me talk about the Ni National Science Foundation. I am a big supporter of NSF. They, off they do key, legitimate government work and, and a priority to keep us ahead of the curve. But even the agencies that I love are wasteful. And so the, the, what we did was a report, and you can't really reflect that on the present management because the present director has only been there six months. So this report that we put forward actually reflects what happened before he got there. But we had some pretty significant findings. You know, when, when, when grants aren't utilized, you are supposed to get the money back. And we found $1.7 billion in money that should be ours that wasn't pulled back. Uh, you know, and that is 25 percent of their annual budget. So we found that money that they should have been pulling back. That was growing every year. And, and all that is is management, uh, paying attention when something expired and, and getting rid of it. Uh, we also found a significant amount of low priority projects, which means they weren't paying attention. Um, $80,000 study why the same teams dominate March Madness. Well, the same teams don't dominate it, so the, the premise under the the study in the first place, and I'm not sure that what that lends to us as a country in terms of creating leading science technology. Uh, so the the point is, is I think if we have great oversight, and I think that's I, I'm on the oversight committee on the other side of the hill. The, the purpose ought to be is to call attention to where we're not we're missing the mark in terms of what our goals are. 
So other things, $1 million for an analysis of how quickly parents respond to trendy baby names. Now, you know, as a scientist, I have trouble finding out how that as a country, especially in a constricted budget environment, is going to help us. You know, what's, what's the positive thing that's going to come out of that research? Maybe there is something, but is it a priority? And, and does a cost-benefit analysis say for what we're going to get, could we have spent the money somewhere else to get much better leading-edge technologies? $315,000 study Farmville, whether Farmville on Facebook helps adults' relationships. $581,000 to study whether online dating users are racist in their dating habits. Uh, maybe there is some value in that, but the point is it is all about priorities. And the reason in a lot of grants <clears throat> that you are not seeing priorities is because we are not looking at it. We are not holding the agencies accountable. Uh, here is a mission statement, here is what we are supposed to be doing, and then they kind of get off track. And the reason they can get off track is because they are not before the Congress every year, somebody going over their grants with them. So uh, aggressive oversight is one of the most important things we can do. It doesn't mean we are right about our assessment of what they are doing, but knowing that they have to come before and explain their grants will limit a lot of questionable grants that go out there for things that don't have great cost-benefit analysis to us. We also found significant fraud and inappropriate expenditures at the National Science Foundation. Uh, uh, we also found significantly poor contracting practices. And let me comment on something the other panel said. There shouldn't be, other than in rare instances, any grant that isn't competitive. There should not be any contract that isn't competitive. And where we know we have problems in our government, for example, we have $64 billion a year in IT, $32 billion of that is at risk. In other words, it is never going to get accomplished. We will have blown 50 percent of our IT budget, and we do it every year. We blow it and because of the way we contract and the way we oversight it. So there is a lot of money that we can spend more wisely and also get greater value for the American public if we make sure, one, that we competitively bid all these things, and number two is we know what we want before we contract. And that is a big problem in the Defense Department. It is a big problem in the large agencies. They don't know what they want and they write a contract anyway. And what they should be doing is waiting until they figure out or create only a research contract to say what is it that we want. It, it is a giant problem that has $100 billion worth of waste a year in the Federal Government. Uh, and let me just talk for a second about the poor contracting practices and then I will stop. Uh, we found that NSF in 2010 spent $422 million for contracts, $283 million of which were not competitively bid. They were cost plus. Um, and, and they were paid regardless of whether the work was completed or not. Uh, Seventy percent of the $204 million went to contracts permitting advance payments to just three groups, and none of these contractors had an approved disclosure statement. So what happened, the agency couldn't identify or document the actual costs, which is a problem with the contract at the beginning. In other words, they didn't do it right at the beginning, and when they got found that they couldn't get what they wanted, they didn't have the tools to find out whether or not they got good value because they couldn't get the information. Uh, and then final, final thing that it, one of the things we have to do as a Congress is, with all the grant, is the tremendous amount of duplication. Uh, and I'll give you an example in the NSF. <coughs> NSF has 15 programs. 50, uh, NSF is one of 15 programs, 72 sub-agencies, and 12 independent agencies engaged in research and development. In other words, we don't just have NIH, the Defense Department Research, and NSF. We have 72 sub-agencies, 15 Federal Departments, and 12 independent agencies. And out of that has come, we are all interested in education. We are interested in getting more scientists, more uh, technologists, more engineers, more math. Well, we now have in the Federal Government 105 science, technology, engineering, and math programs. 18 of them, 28 of them are coming through the, the National Science Foundation at a cost of $1.2 billion. None of them are cross-referenced to see if they are duplicating anything else that the rest of the Federal Government is doing, and not one of them has a metric on it to whether or not it is accomplishing the purpose. 
So the whole idea, when you begin to look at grants, then you start looking at the bigger area. We need to focus down and put somebody in charge of science, technology, and math, but not 12 different agencies that are spending over $2.5 billion a year with no, no measurements in terms of what the results are. So you, you cannot, there's, there's methodology in how the agencies utilize grants, but we are responsible for allowing all the duplication that has come because we have passed the, the legislation and appropriation bills that have actually caused it. And with that, I will take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Coburn, uh, very much for being able to come. I am just going to bounce a couple things off just for additional information. Let me start with the last statement you were making about duplication. Uh, a lot of the stories we have heard, we have seen some of the reports that are coming out on it. How do you get there? How do you actually start combining those? I understand legislatively, ultimately, we have the responsibility, but we are talking about killing one program and moving that money over, whatever percentage it may be, to another and combining multiple agencies. Realistically, how do we get there? I think you, you have to have the leadership where you have cross uh, jurisdiction among committees to have come together and say, okay, we let's say science, technology, engineering, and math. You take the committees in the House and the Senate that are responsible for those. Say, what is it we bring? Have some expert. What is it we really want to accomplish in that? What are the 128 programs we have today, or 105 programs that we have today that are doing that? Where are they directed? And what is it that we really need? And then split that up and come to a consensus that we are going to have a combined committee that is going to address that and, and agree to it. And, and none of these are partisan issues. It is just a matter of silliness and the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. So it is a great question. But you got to have, first of all, you got to know there is a problem there to address it. And then you got to build a consensus within each body to say, let's get together and form a, a joint committee to address science, technology, engineering, math. And, and, and let's eliminate, and let's have one set of bureaucracy running this rather than 20. Right. And, you know, it, what we did with the last debt limit, we got GAO. When we went to GAO and CRS, we asked them this question. We would like a list of all the programs in the Federal Government. They both told us, take a hike, there is no way you can do it. Both of them did. And I understand that. Uh, it is a massive project. There is only one agency that lists all their programs. That is the Department of Education. Not e you can go to any head of any agency and they can't tell you all their programs. They don't even have them written down. So we have, over the next two years, the rest of the Federal Government is going to be coming through GAO to where we are going to see every program, every agency. I am trying to attach in the Senate to every bill that goes through there a mandate that each agency has to list each year of their programs, just so they know what they are and so we can know what they are. And it, the problem is so big and so massive, you have to start by knowing what, the, what are the programs. Uh, last year, two times in one of the committee, I won't name which committee, we had members of the Senate offer amendments to do well-intentioned things without knowing that we already had a program in the Department doing exactly what they were writing. Already, we're, exactly. And, of course, the amendment was withdrawn when they were made aware of that. But the fact is, is most of us as members of the Congress don't, aren't aware. So you have to aggressively have to pursue it. Right. Uh, we have been working on that on this committee as well, uh, looking for areas just to get disclosure out there in the public, even to have a website that lists not only the agency but all the programs that are within that agency so that anyone can get a chance to look and see where their dollars are spent, what programs are available, and how much goes into that program, as well as how many staff are dedicated to that. Yeah. And that uh, gives people a basic look on it. Let me ask you a question about some of these uh, grant programs that you had mentioned before that are coming up that uh, developing a relationship through Farmville. I don't remember a bill that was related to that. How do grants like that come into existence? Well, it's, it's because we're lazy legislators. Uh, what we decide is we'll, gr we'll pass a bill and grant maximum flexibility to the bureaucracy when, in fact, we're transferring our own authority as a Congress to the bureaucracy. We, we, I just came from a hearing in the Senate uh, on regulations. I mean, regulations are killing our country, and that, uh, that's not partisan. It was happening under the Bush administration. It's happening a little more now. It's more important now because we're in the midst of a slow economic time, and we need the regulations to go down so business can, can grow. But when we give up our responsibility to actually direct the agency specifically in terms of what we intend, that's how you get that. 
And, and we, we do that because, number one, we are not thorough. Number two is a lot of times we don't know what we want when we write a piece of legislation, which should be a caution to us. If you don't know what you want, you are not any different than the agency that is passing the ground out there. You need to know what you want before you write it and what you intend and what you expect. And then you need to follow up. You know, when was the, when was the last time every agency in the Federal Government was oversighted? With 535 members of Congress, we could do that every two years if we would do it. And you know what? You would see a marked change in the bureaucracy. Yeah, the, the, the transparency side, not only coming back to Congress to be able to denote that, but also to be able to get it out just to the general public. So any individual can get a chance to look in and see the grants, how they are spent, what they are spent on, and that anyone could look over their shoulder. And so then you have the possibility of a newspaper out there going through all the details of each and every grant. And it is not only a congressional committee, but it is also that, that media source that is out there asking the same questions. Well, you can do that on USAspending.gov right now. If it was populated. With, uh -huh. Yeah. If it was populated with all the information. Yeah. Well, it, it, for example, in museum and, and, and uh, library sciences, I think you could go there and you could see every, every grant. I mean, they are very compliant. Now, they are small, but they have also been extremely aggressive to making sure they are great stewards with that money. That is terrific. I would like to recognize Mr. Conley for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And welcome, Senator Conley. Thank you. And thank you for your, uh, your um, vigilance in uh, protecting the U.S. tax dollar. Uh, and, and shedding some light on, uh, on research and uh, grant uh, funding. Let me just share with you concerns, though, I have uh, maybe on the other side. Um, uh, I heard you say that you thought that all of these grants ideally ought to be competitively bid. Respectfully, I guess I would want to see the ability of the Federal Government in awarding research and development grants uh, preserved. Uh, I would remind uh, us of the fact that, for example, the successful crash effort to make sure the United States had the atom bomb before the Nazis was not competitively bid. Um, I spent 20 years of my life in the private sector for eight, uh, organizations that did Federal research, and I saw firsthand where there was value and, ha and preserving the flexibility for the Federal agency to look at expertise and say, you know, I, I don't want to sort of, you know, reinvent the wheel. You have got that expertise. We want to fund that because that can develop something that is going to help our economy or help medicine or whatever it may be. So just a word of caution. I, I think you are right, and I am not unsympathetic with the idea that, by and large, we ought to have a really good reason why something isn't competitively bid. But to go to a rigid formula where everything is competitively bid, especially in the research field, I think could be risky, frankly, and could choke innovation unwittingly. Let, let, let me respond to that. <clears throat> I think if all else being you only have one company or one institution that is capable of doing what you want to do, I think that is true. Uh, but I would put out to you that the, 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 the reason we have seven major weapons programs in the Defense Department today that are vastly over budget and at risk is because we had cost plus contracting on the research and development and no capital risk exposure by those companies that were involved in it. And human nature is, is whatever you want, since it is cost plus, we will do it for you. So we, we have three problems in the Federal Government in terms of that contracting. One is our, contractor, uh, our, our contracting experts we are losing. We have a real problem with contract managers. We, we are short on them, and we are short on experienced contract managers. And there is great wisdom in them because they have the experience, they have known these businesses, they know who can actually do what. So I I'd, I'd tell you, that is the first thing. The second thing, in a lot of agencies, including the Pentagon, we don't have an adult in the room as far as requirement creep. And when you look at the programs, uh, and the third problem we have is we have across agencies, when we do cost plus contracting, it's lowballed on purpose because they know it's going to cost a whole lot more, but they want to get it started because they know once they get it started and once we get a lot of money invested in it, we'll have to be less reticent to pull the plug on it. So I, I think you could address all those three, but I agree with you. If, if we have a level of expertise, but I would tell you if there are two of them that have that level of expertise, we ought to have them compete. If there is nobody that has the level of expertise, then I am fine. I agree. Fine with that. I agree, and I am glad you brought up acquisition expertise in the Federal Government. And by the way, I commend to you Susan Collins' bill 
I introduced it here in the House. Susan Collins has yeah. a companion bill on the Federal Acquisition Institute trying right. to upgrade those capabilities. We have got to hire more people to manage contracts. And, and you are right, we need continuity. One of the requirement creep often occurs because you have multiple project managers over the life of a contract, yeah. many, many of them. One more point uh, I would like to make, uh, if I, I can, and that is, uh, and you did not do this. I don't mean to imply you did. But one of the things that sometimes concerns me is that in the political arena, we make fun of research. Uh, I can remember in my campaign last year, my opponent uh, went on and on and on about uh, funding research on monkeys. Well, it happened to be HIV research, and monkeys were the best analog to Yeah, they are primate. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was, uh, frankly, to me, a despicable thing, but it became in the political arena. Uh, there is one that came up recently, Mr. Chairman, at the Science and Technology Committee. And uh, the Golden Fleece Award, which was issued by a Democrat from Wisconsin at the time, was given uh, to an odd-sounding study called The Sexual Behavior of the Screwworm Fly. Why would we waste $250,000 on that? And yet that research turns out, uh, which was cost $250,000, saved millions of livestock. Uh, it is estimated that it saved and enhanced the cattle industry profits by $20 billion and lowered the cost of beef at the supermarket by 5 percent. Other than that, yes, it was a frivolous piece of Federal research. So it is easy to demagogue research sometimes, especially with the public not, not spending time on research directly. And I, and I would hope that all of us in the political arena would show a little bit more respect for what we are trying to do, as, as you no, said. I, I agree. There, there's a lot, we, we don't know the depths and, and the intents, but that is the other thing that ought to be put in the grant. What are we trying to accomplish here? When, when, you, when you read a grant proposal and you don't see the endpoint in it, and you don't see what they're actually going for, then we ought to be at, we ought to be asking a question about every one of those. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's the same thing like the, the the pine beetle out west right now. If we'd had good research on hurting its reproductive capability, we wouldn't have half the forests in Colorado and Wyoming turning brown right now. So, uh, look, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I believe in science. It's why I'm still alive. But the point is, is even our good agencies like NSF need to be oversighted so that when they they're they're not paying attention, they will pay attention, and that's my whole point. Thank you. I'd enjoy multiple rounds of conversation with us, but you have a vote coming up very shortly as well on the Senate side. We appreciate your time and uh, very much value your input on this, and look forward to getting a chance for our committees to be able to work together in the future. Thank you very much. And with that, this committee hearing is adjourned. <laughs>